In the Paleolithic or Old Stone Age world, humans lived much differently than we do today. Most humans lived as hunter-gatherers in small communities. They were nomadic, moving throughout the year to follow animal herds. Everything they took with them had to be portable or easily replaced. With the inventions of agriculture and animal domestication, however, some people started living in permanent settlements. This is called the Neolithic Revolution. Today, we're going to look at one of the areas of the world that has some of the earliest evidence of agriculture in early cities, the Fertile Crescent. We're going to create a typical village to learn about aspects of this early civilization and what changed over time. You should already have a copy of the document that you'll be working in. If for some reason you can't edit it, go to the top and click on File, Make a Copy. This way you'll have your own document that you can edit. Do not request edit access. Got that all set up? All right, let's go. This area is geographically dominated by two rivers called the Tigris and the Euphrates. A desert climate surrounds the area with these two rivers providing water. This region is known as Mesopotamia, which means land between two rivers. The headwaters, or where the rivers start, are in the mountains to the northwest. When the weather warmed, snow would melt off the mountains and rush into the rivers, creating floods. After the water levels went down, they left behind a layer of mud called silt. Really quick, let's go over what you need to do for this activity. The video will explain some things and then show and tell you what things you need to add to your own document. Pause the video when you see the pause symbol. That screen will have the number of each item you need to add to your own document. Make the changes to your copy. Once you've finished making changes, hit play. It's 5,500 BCE, and people in this area of the world have completely shifted from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a permanent settlement. Extended families or clans live in houses close to each other and are near the river to have access to water and because of the silt. Wait, why did they want to live near mud? The silt is very fertile, which means it's perfect for growing plants in. They grew massive quantities of food like dates, pomegranates, chickpeas, figs, flax, olives, onions, wheat, and barley. They grew so much they even had a surplus or extra. They stored the surplus grain in granaries and storehouses, and it was this surplus that helped change the future of the world. But we'll get there later. If you need to, you can delete trees to make room for other items. Find the mud brick house image. Copy and paste five mud brick houses in a clump in the middle-ish of your drawing. Click the scribble tool. Draw a path so they have access to water. Make the line four point and light brown. Find the barley field image. Copy and paste five fields. Remember, the silt on the riverbank is fertile and this area is desert, so they need to be near the river. The river is too wide to swim and it's impractical to use boats to get to the other side to farm. They all need to be on the village side of the river. Find the granary image. Copy and paste one near the houses. Find the animal herd image. Copy and paste five herds on the edges of the drawing. Now your village is all set up for how one in ancient Mesopotamia would have been. Let's see what changes in your village as the years pass. It's now 5000 BCE, and as the population grew, a civilization developed. People in a civilization share common elements like language and customs. This fertile crescent culture was called Sumer. As the Sumerian population grew, they needed more food to feed everyone, and the old farming methods weren't producing enough food. One way they increased food production was by inventing the plow. Before the plow, Sumerians used digging sticks, but this took a long time. Sumerians discovered if you made the sticks in a V shape and attached a handle, the bottom part of the V would create a row for seeds to be planted. They attached a strong animal like a cow or an ox to the front of the plow. All the farmer had to do was steer. This sped up the time it took to ready and plant a field and required less work, which resulted in more food. From now on, you may move animal herds if needed to add any items, but you can't delete them. Add 10 fields. Two plows, put them in the fields. Three animal herds, five mud brick houses. Sumerians also used irrigation to increase their food supply. They knew the rivers would flood, so they dug canals. When the floods came, the water rushed through the canals, which led to basins and fields. Once there was enough water in the basins and canals, and before the floodwaters receded, they closed the canal entrance gaps to keep the water in. 
Farmers were supposed to keep their basins and canals in good condition, and everyone was expected to help with repairs or digging new ones. Using the line tool, add in five canals that extend past each of your fields. Make each canal blue and four point. Make them about this length or shorter. Add 20 fields that will be watered by your new canals. 10 houses to your house clump, two animal herds, two granaries. It's now 4000 BCE and your village and other Sumerian villages have started increasing in size and become towns and then cities. Large cities such as Ur, Eridu, and Uruk become city-states. City-states control the city and the land surrounding it. Remember how I said the food surplus was going to change the world? At the beginning, almost everyone is a farmer who grows their whole food supply themselves. But each farmer, with their new plow and irrigation, can now produce two or more times as much as they did before. This means that not everyone had to be a farmer to survive. Some people stopped farming and started doing specialized jobs like metalsmithing or cloth weaving and would trade their items or skills to the farmers for food. Add one mine. It can be anywhere on the village side of the river. One fishing boat in the river. Add the following near your houses. One iron smelter, one metal smith, one stone cutter, one city market, one weaver, one bricklayer, one potter, ten fields, three animal herds, two granaries, twenty houses. The job specialization and surplus meant Sumerians could build large projects like ziggurats or temples. A ziggurat looks like a pyramid made out of sun-baked mud bricks and two to seven step-like layers. Sumerians were polytheists. Poly means many and theo means god, so polytheist means belief in multiple gods. They built the ziggurat at the center of the city-state and there the priests would perform rituals and sacrifices. Sumerians believed that they needed to keep the gods happy or else the rains might not come and their crops might fail. Priests were the only ones allowed on the ziggurat because it was their responsibility to care for and communicate with the gods. This made them very powerful members of society. Add one ziggurat in the middle of your page. Because it's the most important building, everything you add now should surround it. Early leadership came from directing canal work and the priest's connection to the gods. Each city-state had its own ruler who was their king and high priest for the Sumerian religion. They were called priest kings or god kings. Governments organized canal labor or built the walls and paid soldiers to defend the city-state against invading city-states. The people gave some surplus food to pay their taxes to the government, who in turn used it to provide safety. Add one palace. Put it near the ziggurat. One armory for the soldiers. Put it near the ziggurat. One cemetery for the dead soldiers. Put it on the outskirts of the city. One metalsmith, three bricklayers. Use the circle tool to draw an oval shaped wall around your city state clump. Make its fill transparent, outline gray, and four point. Right click, choose order, send to back. The edges of the oval should almost touch the top, bottom, and right sides of the page. All your fields, canals, Cemeteries, mines, and animal herds must be outside the city walls. As the Sumerian cities grew larger, several aspects about life changed. First, due to job specialization, social classes developed. Most people in Sumer were still commoners. Farmers, artisans, craftspeople, soldiers, and servants. Their labor and surplus production supported the upper class, which consisted of high-level officials, priests, and the ruler. At the bottom of the social ladder were the slaves and servants. Gender roles also changed, and while historians have given a number of reasons, we don't know for sure why they changed. Whatever the case, early Sumer was a patriarchal civilization. Patriarchy just means that in that society, men hold the power and it benefits them while disadvantaging women. In general, society and laws made women dependent on their husbands. For example, it was easier for men to divorce women than the other way around, and men controlled more of the trade and economics. Finally, with the growth of cities, that meant more people were in close proximity to others. This enabled diseases to spread faster and kill more people than in hunter-gatherer communities. Add three nice houses near the ziggurat for the upper class. 
one monument to men, two cemeteries on the outskirts. It's 3300 BCE, and with all of the different jobs in your city-state, it's hard to remember all of the different business transactions. So the Sumerians came up with something we take for granted, writing. Their early writing consisted of pictographs, or images and symbols that represent things. They drew these pictographs at first into clay tablets, but later used an Egyptian invention called papyrus, which is a type of paper. At first, the images were simple. A picture of a cow meant cow. But over time, the pictographs became more symbolic and also incorporated sounds and meanings. This system of writing is called cuneiform, which means wedge-shaped. Most Sumerians are farmers or craftspeople who don't have time to learn all the cuneiform symbols. Those who did were called scribes, and it became their job to read and write. This made scribes a very important group in Sumerian society. Add one scribe school near the ziggurat, ten houses, one mine, one iron smelter, one stone cutter, one fishing boat, one city market, one weaver, one potter, one city gate. Put it along the wall where you want the main entrance to your city to be. Fifteen fields. Extend your canals to make them go further inland so you can put fields there if needed. Two granaries, one animal herd. As people continued getting better at their specialization, foreign people became interested in trading. It was tedious carrying everything back and forth on donkeys and camels or by yourself. But remember, most Sumerian city-states were built near rivers. Sumerians invented the sailboat by adding a cloth sail to a boat made of wood or papyrus. Sailboats helped trade, but also increased opportunities for fishermen and managing the canal systems. Sumerians traded as far as the Indus River, Anatolia, and Egypt. Add three sailboats to your river. Now that you can access the other bank of the river easier, you may plant fields there and build canals. Remember the farmers and specialized workers traded items for what they needed? As more and more people specialized, however, there were problems with this system. What if the farmer wants bricks? but the bricklayer wants iron and the iron smelter wants cloth. To solve this, your fellow Sumerians invented the concept of money. Instead of doing a confusing multi-way trade, the farmer can give money to the bricklayer who can give money to the iron smelter and so on. Money is an item that everyone accepts has a certain value. In the case of Mesopotamia, that item could be barley or silver. A certain weight of silver was worth a certain amount of barley and either could be used for taxes or purchases. Add one mine, one metalsmith. It's 3200 BCE, and someone in your city-state discovered they could move heavy things easier if they rolled it over a log. After multiple innovations, they realized they might not need the whole log, just the ends. They created an axle to connect the wheels to each other and to the cargo area. The cargo area was connected to the axle with hollow tubes so that the axle and wheels could spin. Sumerians could now use animals to pull these carts and wagons to move heavy loads much faster and much easier. Add one cart on your path, 10 homes, one iron smelter, one stone cutter, one city market, one weaver, one bricklayer, one potter, 10 fields, one animal herd, one granary. It's 3000 BCE. For many years, Sumerians have been using clay tokens to represent items and goods. One token might represent one goat or one unit of grain, depending on what mark was on the token. But soon Sumerians realized they needed a way to simplify larger quantities. It didn't take that long to record a delivery of three goats via tokens to the temple, but it took a much longer time to record a delivery of a hundred goats with tokens. Sumerians had to create a symbol for the amount in addition to the symbol for the item. This is how they invented a number system. Early Mesopotamians decided a cone means one unit, and to mean 10 units, you could write 10 cones or just a small circle. Six small circles equaled one big cone. 10 big cones equaled a big cone with a circle in it. Six big cones with circles equaled a large circle, and 10 large circles equaled a large circle with a circle inside. The biggest unit was worth 36,000 of the original cones or units. As time passed, these symbols evolved so they could fit in with cuneiform writing. So if the temple got a delivery of 10 goats, they would make the small circle symbol and the symbol for goat to record the transaction. More people need to learn how to be scribes and do math. Add one school. Along with math came the concept of time, which they also based on a system of 60. 
Every 60 seconds was one minute, and every 60 minutes was one hour. There were 24 hours in a day, and the year was broken into 12 months of 29 to 30 days. Sound familiar? Counting days and months helped with when to plant or harvest and when to hold religious festivals. Add one sundial near one of your schools. 10 houses, one iron smelter, one metal smith, one stone cutter, one city market, one weaver, one bricklayer, one potter, 10 fields. If you need to, you can extend your canals. One animal herd, two granaries. It's 2150 BCE and your town is unveiling its newest accomplishment, the world's first piece of literature called the Epic of Gilgamesh. The original Gilgamesh was the king of the Urukai. Wait, no, that's from Lord of the Rings. No, I meant the city-state, Uruk. Anyway, this guy was king and the tales of his adventures have grown, passed down by oral tradition, and now they've been written down in the first piece of epic literature. While there were earlier Sumerian writings, this is the first literary epic masterpiece. Add one Epic of Gilgamesh tablet inside the city. It's 2334 BCE and things have taken kind of a drastic turn. Your city-state has been invaded. Sargon the Great has defeated all the Sumerian city-states, bringing Mesopotamia, areas on the Mediterranean coast, and Turkey into one Akkadian empire. To maintain control of his new empire, Sargon set up Akkadian governors and administrators to control the conquered regions. He also made his daughter, Enhudwana, the high priestess at Ur, who had considerable religious control. She is actually the first author we know by name. This empire provided stability since the city-states weren't fighting each other anymore. Roads and irrigation canals improved, trade expanded, and the arts and sciences increased. They even created the world's first postal system, complete with envelopes for the clay tablets. More improvements included instituting a standard measurement system, creating a fair taxation system, and constructing new buildings. Hang Sargon's Akkadian flag over the ziggurat. Add one measurement building, one tax building, one post office, two armories, ten houses, one iron smelter, one metalsmith, one stone cutter, one city market, one weaver, one bricklayer, one potter, five fields, one animal herd, two granaries. It's 1792 BCE and the Akkadian Empire has fallen. Mesopotamia moved back into a series of smaller empires and city-states until Hammurabi arrived and conquered Mesopotamia, adding it to the Babylonian Empire. While he did some other important things like erecting monuments, organizing food distribution, and building canals, his biggest accomplishment was the creation of one of the first codes of law. Hammurabi's code states the crime and a punishment that fit it. For example, one law is, if a builder builds a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built falls in and kills its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. If it kills the son of the owner of the house, the son of that builder shall be put to death. Pretty straightforward. But laws were also dependent on the social status of the person. For example, one law says, if a man put out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out. But another says, if he put out the eye of a man's slave or break the bone of a man's slave, he shall pay one half its value. Look at all these punishment variations on the same crime based on the social status of the person. Hang Hammurabi's Babylonian flag over Sargon's. Add one justice department, two armories, ten houses, one iron smelter, one metalsmith, one stone cutter, one city market, one weaver, one bricklayer, one potter, five fields, one animal herd, two granaries. It's 1750 BCE and Hammurabi has died, effectively ending the Babylonian Empire and this activity. We've learned how geography influenced the early Mesopotamians, how their religious ideas were formed, what achievements they made, how their political systems emerged, and how their social and economic systems developed. Let's recap that info. Open up your wrap-up document and follow the directions.